Uh, good evening to all. I have great pleasure in inviting you to the 14th Raja Ramana Memorial Lecture, be given by a very eminent person, Dr. R.B. Grover. And he's going to talk on realization of international civil nuclear cooperation, a technical perspective. I request uh, Dr. Shailesh Naik and Director Niyas to give his introductory remarks and chair the session. Dr. Gower, the members of the Dr. Raja Ramana family, participants, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to have this uh, Ramana Memorial Lecture and we have Professor Ravi Grover to give a talk. Uh, as you know, I'm not going to tell much about uh, Dr. Ramana, but few things I would like to mention. The, one of the important thing is the uh, founding director. He had brought uh, some culture where we always try to look at the any societal or any major issue from the various angles, right from the from social science or a performing arts or a humanity, music, so many different angles. And uh, today I also learned that uh, he was a great foodie and uh, the canteen which we have, he has, he and his wife, Mrs. Ramanna, saw to it that the food served is of excellent quality. So there are many facets of his, I think as time passes, uh, we will learn about more and more about Dr. Ramanna. The most important thing which uh, impressed me was uh, 30 years back when somebody is talking to integrate science and social science, uh, probably he was far, far ahead of his time. I don't know whether you know or not, but uh, very recently the International Council of Scientific Unions and International Council of Social Science have been merged to have a single entity which is called International Council of Science. And this, I think, is a major step because we realize that only generating a knowledge is not sufficient. Unless you have the knowledge and acceptable to the society, then only you will really see the fruits. There are many examples of this, but I'm not going to go into the details of that. The second, which is very important uh, thing which he did uh, is he tried to bring the people from a different uh, strata of the society, maybe a businessman or an industrialist or a musician or a dancer or any, any kinds of thing. And this enriched the uh, working and the our delivery to the society in the Niyas. So I, we will be always extremely grateful to him for uh, thinking of such a novel idea and uh, which today, because of that, the Niyas is uh, recognized as a institute of uh, exceptional repute by the Niti Aayog. And I think uh, there are very few institutes which have been only 30 institutes in the country. So it's really a proud moment for all of us. And I think the reason for that, the foundation which he did was so strong. And today's uh, speaker, Professor Ravi Grover, is also going to talk about civil nuclear. Normally when nuclear comes, we always think is a defense. But I think this is the legacy of Dr. Ramanna where he will say that why this is also very critical for the civil society. A few words about Professor Ravi Grover. He is currently Hobi Baba Chair in the Department of Atomic Energy and Hobi Baba National Institute, Mumbai. He is also a member of the Atomic Energy Commission and a Fellow of Indian Academy of Engineering a fellow of World Academy of Art and Science, and represent India in ITR Council as the chair of the Indian delegation. He was vice chancellor of uh, Homi Baba National Institute till February 2016. In BRC, basically worked as a research and developmental engineer 
especially in the nuclear reactor thermal hydraulics and safety studies. He was responsible for thermal hydraulic design of the core and the fuel of 100 megawatt research reactor Dhruva and led a team of engineers for evolving process design of primary systems, dynamic analysis of the plant systems and the fuel and the core hydraulics analysis for a compact reactor. The most important uh, thing which he played a very significant and a key role in the negotiation about the civil nuclear threat, including various negotiations with the various countries which helped India to join the ITR venture. And uh, he also had played a very pioneer role in setting up the Homi Baba National Institute, and he led the institute for a very long time, almost uh, more than 11 years. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Professor Grover, and may I request you to deliver your Raman Memorial Lecture. Professor Shalesh Nayak, members of <coughs> Dr. Raza Ramana's family, participants in the 33rd Annual Program for Senior Executives, ladies and gentlemen and invitees. I'm overwhelmed to see so many distinguished individuals in the audience. And I thank uh, Niaz for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you. First of all, allow me to pay my tribute to Dr. Raja Ramanna. I first met him in late 1983. I had gone to Argonne National Laboratory, USA, to attend a course on probabilistic safety analysis. In early 80s, this subject was just evolving, and in BARC, we were just beginning to learn the subject. So I was deputed to attend the course. When I returned, Dr. Ramana called me, and he wanted to get complete information about this subject, uh, which we were just trying to know more and more in BARC. So I had a detailed uh, dialogue with him and Dr. Ramana was fascinated by mathematical details of the subject. There's a lot of uh, different kind of mathematics which goes into it, and the kind of questions which he asked that really uh, impressed me and uh, made me go more and more into detail into this subject. And of course, after that first visit, subsequently I met him on several occasions in the context of the project which BRC was working and was aimed at uh, developing a compact reactor for marine applications. Uh, then in 2001, DAE constituted a, a DAE Science Research Council with Dr. Banna as the chairman and I was the secretary of that council. And during the course of various meetings, I came in close contact with him and was impressed by his vision and uh, strategic thinking. And one of the key decisions which were taken up early by him uh, as a chairman of the DA Science Research Council was to set up Homi Bhabha National Institute, which I had the privilege uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Nayak has said that I was the first head of this, that I uh, privilege of heading that for about 11 years. All of us in SPNI and DAE owe a lot to Dr. Ramanna for this uh, initiative, for his unequivocal endorsement of the idea of setting up of HBNI. And Dr. Ramanna was a multidimensional personality engaged in pursuit of excellence in science, philosophy, and music. Indeed, very inspiring personality. And when I talk about this subject, which I have taken up for today, uh, while I was going through all the motions of this particular uh, engagement with the international community, I could see a clear interaction uh, between science, engineering, diplomacy, 
politics, law, and it is why it is necessary to look at all the topic in a very, very holistic manner. Uh, this particular subject of opening up uh, of uh, international civil nuclear cooperation was extensively discussed at the political level from mid-2005 to end-2008. Of course, it continues to be debated even now, but occasionally. I've lived through this process of opening up as a foot soldier who was looking at the nuts and bolts while leadership was provided by the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, the then National Security Advisor, and the then Chairman Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, the working group which was uh, negotiating was chaired by Foreign Secretary, initially Shyam Saran, who is going to be here on Saturday, and later Shiv Shankar Menon. Uh, I limit myself to technical dimension. Of course, there was interaction between technical dimension and other dimensions. Uh, if those of you who want to look at the diplomatic aspects of this particular initiative, I suggest there are a book written by Shyam Saran, How India Sees the Word Cotillia to the 21st Century. He has devoted uh, two chapters to this particular aspect. Another book by Shiv Shankar Menon, uh, choices inside the making of Indian foreign policy, he again has devoted a full chapter to all the diplomatic effort which uh, went behind uh, this particular uh, initiative. As I said earlier, this entire process which uh, uh, went on for two and a half years very intensely from mid-2005 to end 2008, demonstrates a very strong linkage between science, technology, diplomacy, and law. How diplomacy is being used to create and perpetuate discriminatory regimes, how as a country we have to be vigilant to protect our interests, and above all, how various agency of the agencies of the government have to work in sync to achieve results for the country. Uh, let me uh, go through certain preliminary details to bring you to the, this topic, the importance of this topic. Just to recapitulate that Atomic Energy Commission was set up in 1948, just one year after independence. This demonstrates the vision of the leadership of the country at that time. Not only Atomic Energy Commission was set up, Atomic Energy Act was uh, enacted in 1948, Department of Atomic Energy in 1954, Apsara, a swimming pool reactor, it achieved first criticality in 1956 and subsequently Cyrus in 1960. It was realized as the country's moving ahead, Atomic Energy Act 1948 is not enough. It was replaced by an, a new act, 1962, which uh, uh, went into much more details. And at that time, collaborations were established with several countries, including the USA, the UK, and France. And of course, Russia has been always our uh, traditional partner. Tarapur reactors, first Tarapur 1 and 2, which were set up, there was a turnkey project by the USA, collaboration with Canada was established for setting up a pressurized high water reactor. Plutonium plant was set up in BARC based on totally indigenous efforts. It uh, came online in mid 60s. And of course, Dhruva again based on totally indigenous efforts attained criticality in 1985. And over the years, uh, technological capability has been developed uh, in the complete chain of activities, uh, starting from exploration to mining of uranium, fabrication of a variety of fuel pins, heavy water production, designing and setting up pressurized heavy water reactors, spent fuel, uh, reprocessing and waste management, including partitioning of actinides. Now, India has uh, very, very modest reserves of uranium, and this was realized by early leadership that we have to formulate a program 
to take care of the fact that we should uh, extract the full energy potential of uranium, whatever we have in the country. So they formulated the approach which is known scientifically as a closed uh, fuel cycle approach. But I again wonder at the leadership of that time to convey to the public in a manner, if you say closed fuel cycle approach, people will not understand. It was conveyed as a three-stage program by the department. I consider uh, it uh, as a, I should say, very well method of conveying to common public that it's a stage-wise program. But closed fuel cycle only those people who have background in science and engineering can understand. But three-stage program, everyone will understand it's a three-stage program. Again, credit goes to the leadership of that time. Uh, here now I just come to uh, uh, further details that we have a treaty on the non-proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, commonly known as NPT. It divides the globe into haves and have-nots. Haves are those who have nuclear weapons, have-nots who do not have nuclear weapons. So this division of the world into nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states is something which is embedded in this treaty. Uh, international safeguards uh, which result into accounting of nuclear materials, control of nuclear materials emanate from this treaty. Safeguards, uh, export controls also emanate from this treaty. And this treaty, through one of its articles, provides for peaceful nuclear explosion. Article 5 clearly says that the countries can go in for peaceful nuclear explosions and uh, they can take advantage of peaceful nuclear explosions. Not only this, art, uh, it is provided for in NPT, International Atomic Energy Agency used to have annual conferences on peaceful nuclear explosion as to how they can be used for diverting uh, river, uh, reverse passages, how they can be used for exploration of oil, and so on and so forth. And these conferences continued up to the year 1975. Even in BRC, we have proceedings of all those conferences. But once India conducted a peaceful nuclear explosion in 1974, the concept of peaceful nuclear explosion disappeared from the lexicon on this subject. This is a point to be noted by all Indians. This is complete change happened at that time. Only those states which have built and exploded a nuclear device before 1st January 1967 are classified as nuclear weapon state, and this has been uh, kind of ridiculed by many people, and the most vocal uh, uh, sort of articulation about this was made by Mohammed El Barade, who was uh, Director General of IAEA for three terms. He wrote an op-ed in The Economist in 2003. He says about NPT, what is NPT? It's early bird gets the nuke. What's the rationale behind the cutoff date 67? There is no scientific uh, reason for that. It was just to limit the certain advantages to certain set of people. So after 1974, those people who are devoted to NPT, they cast India into another world. And it was abruptly denied, India was abruptly denied all international collaboration on the peaceful uses of nuclear energy available to states which are recognized as nuclear weapon state as NPT, in the NPT. But India remained steadfast in its resolve to develop nuclear technologies and achieved notable successes. Uh, NPT was opened for signature in 1968. It entered into force in 1970. Uh, and then uh, NPT was supposed to be only for 25 years, but it was indefinitely extended in 1995. So in the 90s, there was a situation. NPT has been indefinitely extended. In the conference, of dis on, conference on disarmament in Geneva, 
was discussing CTBT, where India was put in a certain category that unless India signs this, CTBT will not come into force. The whole country uh, was uh, in a situation, either we uh, explored actual devices right now or it will be never. And again, the leadership of the country took the decision and India went in for three underground tests on 11th May 98 and two on 13th May 1998. Oh, immediately after that, intense diplomatic engagement followed. And I think um, there were many groups who went to various uh, capitals. And that was the time when I was drawn into this particular field. Uh, I was also part of uh, one of the delegations at that time to a particular world capital. And subsequently, there were this engagement, diplomatic engagements intensified. And the result was a mass release of a mass a set of statements which were uh, entitled Next Steps in Strategic Partnership. They were released simultaneously on 13th January 2004 by the Prime Minister of India, Atal Bihari Vajpayee at that time in New Delhi, and the President of uh, the USA in Washington. Now, if you analyze this statement in detail, its benefit to the nuclear industry was only symbolic. Or, but it created uh, a situation, it became uh, created an optics that yes, India and the US are moving together, and it did become a building block for a future dialogue. Uh, Condoleezza Rice visited India on 15th March 2005, and the two sides agreed on a dialogue on energy, including nuclear energy. And Shyam Saran has written a, a little more in his book about it, that we had a dialogue, ongoing dialogue with European Union on energy. And she felt, why not a dialogue between India and the EU also? The purpose of that visit in March 2005 was to have a dialogue on energy. And she also extended an invitation to PM to visit the USA and then uh, external affairs minister networking at that time, he led a delegation to the USA for a strategic dialogue in mid-2005, again, that paved the way for further uh, uh, dialogues here. I think uh, Jay Shankar has given a talk from this very podium uh, last year or so. The both Jay Shankar and I were part of this uh, uh, delegation, and this finally paved the way for the visit of the PM to USA in July 2005. Uh, the joint statement of uh, 2000, July 18, 2005, which was released during the visit by the PM, that became a, a major uh, statement to proceed further. Uh, the USA appreciated India's commitment to prevent WMD proliferation and stated that as a responsible state with advanced nuclear technology, India should acquire the same benefits and advantages as other such states. Now this phrase, uh, advanced, uh, as a responsible state with advanced nuclear technology was the best they could go because they didn't want to say India is a nuclear weapon state because there are so many things built into the various legislations of the USA so this word is somehow uh, was taken by them as something which is equivalent to that to proceed further. They committed to work to achieve full civil nuclear energy cooperation with India to enable it to realize its goals of promoting nuclear power and achieving energy security. Agreed to seek agreement from Congress to adjust US laws and policies agreed to work with friends and allies to adjust international regimes to enable full civil nuclear cooperation with and trade with India, agreed to consult with other part participants of Generation 4 International for uh, agreed to uh, uh, make India a party to ITER and also Generation 4 International Forum 
uh, so that India can be a part of the thing. Now here, ITER is very important. Uh, ITER, uh, when first it was proposed, it's an abbreviation of for International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. ITER is also, in Latin, it means the way, but now the earlier detail has been dropped and it's only called as ITER. It began in 1985 as a Reagan Gorbachev initiative with equal participation of the Soviet Union, the European Union, the USA, and Japan. Design was complete in 2001 under the auspices of the IAEA and negotiation to launch the projects started thereafter. Over the years, more parties joined. I'll give more details towards the end if the time permits. And in the joint statement, India reciprocally agreed to assume the same responsibilities and practices and acquire the same benefits and advantages as other leading countries with advanced nuclear technology, such as the USA. These responsibilities and practices consist of identifying and separating civilian and military nuclear facilities and programs in a phased manner. I think it's very important to note here, India agreed to identify the facilities. It's a job which India said it will do itself. It is not something which will be imposed by any outsider. Voluntarily placing its civilian nuclear facilities under IAEA safeguards. It, whatever India do, it will do when it thinks it should be done signing and adhering to an additional protocol with respect to civilian nuclear facilities. So here again, uh, there is an additional protocol which various countries sign to, it's a protocol additional to the safeguards agreement which various countries sign. It has a standard template. So the word here is an additional protocol, not the additional protocol. I am trying to emphasize this, that every word you write in negotiations in a treaty becomes important so it is uh, so, so you have to be clear about what goals you want to achieve and use the words and here uh, i think english grammar also has to be taken care of not only the substance here continuing india's unilateral moratorium on nuclear testing this was something which our prime minister at that time, Atal Bihari Vajpayee had already announced in the parliament, working with the USA for the conclusion of multilateral FMCT. Here again, uh, the word is multilateral. It has to be negotiated by all the countries. It's not bilateral FMCT. Refraining from transfer of enrichment and reprocessing technologies to states that do not have them, and supporting international efforts to limit their spread. Yes, this is, has been uh, India's policy always, not to transfer sensitive technology outside. So this recognizes two things, that India has those technologies, and of course India will not transfer them. Ensuring that the necessary steps have been taken, taken to secure nuclear materials and technology through comprehensive export control legislation and through harmonization and adherence to MTCR and NSG guidelines. So this is what India agreed. Now what were the triggers for this initiative? It's very uh, sort of uh, important to understand that. On the Indian side, main trigger was that we have very modest reserves of uranium. At that time, identified reserves were something like uh, uh, less than 100,000 tons of uranium oxide, which can support only 10,000 megawatt of PSWRs, which is very sm small number for the size of our country. So our, all our nuclear power plants are operating at very low capacity factors. Capacity factors drop to as low as 50%, which is uh, while nuclear power plants should operate normally 80% or 80% plus. So that was the main trigger from our side to go in for this particular uh, initiative. On the U.S. side, uh, if you study the literature, there are two different narratives. One is strategic, which some people have called as uh, structural, and the other is uh, scientific. 
uh, very a good detail of uh, strategic uh, narrative is given in uh, a monograph written by Ashley Tellis in 2005, and this monograph is released just four days uh, before the joint statement of 18 July 2005. Uh, monograph is India as a Global Nuclear Power, an Action Agenda by the U.S. And here he enumerates six end states that we can give them safety technology, we can give them a few components for the secondary site and so on. And the final six state, which is states, is to integrate India as a legitimate nuclear weapon state with all privileges. Uh, he advocated that nothing should be done to cap India's nuclear deterrent as it would be at a severe disadvantage with service Beijing. And Iti Abraham has uh, written about the rise of China and a need to balance its rise and adds India's economic growth as an important factor. So, Iti Ibrahim wrote this paper in 2006, but prior to both these papers by monograph by uh, Ashley Tellis and the paper, another monograph by Iti Ibrahim, there was a paper by Condoleezza Rice in the year, uh, in the January 2000 issue, issue of uh, Foreign Affairs Journal, uh, where uh, uh, she writes campaign 2000 promoting the national interest. At that time, the campaign for the Bush president, Bush to become president was going on. And she gives a hint about balancing uh, that India should be treated in a manner such that it can be a match for Beijing uh, in the years to come. But on the scientific side, Growing capability of in nuclear science and engineering was being noticed. And of course, uh, several years after the joint statement, in the year 2014, Anish uh, Goyal writes in the journal Science and Diplomacy. He gives a detailed account, writes, after years of careful analysis and foundational work supported by expertise, then he continues, writes. This indicates how the U.S. was studying in what way our capabilities are growing. Ashley Ellis in the monograph writes that Indian nuclear science could actually contribute to the success of these uh, research efforts. He's talking of the new reactor systems which are being developed by consortium of nations. That India also, if joins, it will be useful uh, thanks paradoxically to the enormous repository of indigenous theoretical and engineering capability that has been developed as a result of decades of forced isolation. And Sig Hacker, uh, he uh, was director of Los Alamos Laboratory for two terms and he visited India several times. In 2008, he was asked to give a testimony to one of the US standing committees. He writes directly about India's capability. He says that I found that whereas sanctioned slowed progress in nuclear energy, but they made India self-sufficient in nuclear technologies and world leaders in fast reactor technologies. While much of the world's approach to India has been to limit its access to nuclear technology, it may well be that today we limit ourselves by not having full access to India's nuclear technology developments. Such technical views should help to advise the diplomatic efforts with India. So this is how the US was monitoring the way our science and technology was being developed. And technological capability of Indian technology capability was becoming a concern for US as there was no treaty-based obligation on India to not to export whatever India was doing. India was pursuing a closed fuel cycle and Again, it was being written by various uh, uh, st pe uh, concern, people in the USA who are concerned with strategic issues that India will be awash with uh, plutonium, which they can use for whatever purpose they want. So tightening of India's export controls was considered far more important for the US security than capping and rolling back India's strategic program. By that time, U.S. was knowing how uh, Pakistan has been proliferating enrichment technologies globally. So, but 
Regarding India's export controls, India had been following and continues to follow a virtuous path, but the outside, outside world was imposing costs by denying international trade. So Ashley Telly writes, beyond a certain point, virtue cannot remain its own reward. So there was worry how long will India leave this path and uh, go in the same fashion and try to make money by exporting sensitive technology. So these people, strategic thinkers in USA, were advocating a deal with India uh, so that it ensures sustainability of India's export controls. So when uh, we went into the negotiations, what were the core issues which were important to India? One, declaring a facility present or future as civilian only when India has determined that it was not of relevance to the strategic program. This was one of the core issues for us. Second, maintaining integrity and reliability of our strategic program. Continuing research and development in pursuit of closed fuel cycle or one can say three-stage program uh, which was used in uh, uh, common dialogue to meet our nuclear power requirements, safeguards only by the International Atomic Energy Agency. In the early years, there were no safeguards by International Atomic Energy Agency. So, so USA and some other countries, they were insisting on bilateral safeguards. The US Atomic Energy Act still includes some remnants of uh, uh, bilateral safeguards, so it was we didn't want that we should be obligated to the USC for anything. It should be only to the International Atomic Energy Agency. The safeguard should be applied only by them. Protecting our interests in the event of a unilateral cessation of cooperation. This was another very important issue for us. As far as export controls are concerned, it was just not an issue for us. Uh, uh, we had. Been institutionalized, we institutionalized export controls long back in uh, NSD terminology. They have two lists uh, which are controlled from the export's point of view. Nuclear items, they come in what is colloquially known as trigger lists. And then second is the dual use list. So in India, uh, we have, our nomenclature is different. We call it uh, SCOMET items. Uh, this uh, SCOMET items are, uh, I think it's uh, chemical organism materials, special chemicals, organism material, engineering and technology. And the list, nuclear list is controlled by DA and all the remaining are dual use lists. They are controlled through an interagency process where DA is one party. And again, uh, we, had, uh, we have no difficulty with regard to ensuring that uh, WMD technology, technologies for nuclear weapons fall into wrong hands because we had already an, uh, enacted this weapons of mass destruction and their delivery systems, prohibition of unlawful activities act in 2005, colloquially this is referred to as uh, WMD act. So the action we are already taking based on our own. Uh, so when we formulated our separation plan to separate uh, uh, civilian facilities from strategic facilities, all these issues were built into that particular separation plan, which is a document which can download from the uh, internet. It states that a facility will be designated as civilian only when India has determined that it is not relevant to its strategic program. It provides for a determination by India as to which of its future reactors has to be designated as civilian. So this totally determ de determination by India, it designates 14 thermal reactors as civilian and envisages placing them under safeguards by the IAEA in a phased manner by December 2014. It also designates several fuel cycle facilities as civilian. It does not designate FBTR or under construction PFBR as civilian, it doesn't offer them for safeguards. Uh, we had a 40 megawatt research reactor, Cyrus, operating at that time in BARC, and continuing to operate that would have become difficult because it was set up in collaboration with Canadians. 
So offering them for, uh, for safeguards would have meant that uh, international inspectors would enter BRC, which we didn't want. So we proposed, uh, it was as it is, nearing the end of life, we proposed that this reactor should be shut down. And there was another reactor, Apsara, which was in BARC. It has a high enriched core. The core was supplied by UK. And we shift, shut down Apsara. Again, uh, it, the whole building was uh, uh, becoming very old. And uh, the en highly enriched uranium core was taken out and shifted to a safeguarded place. And that is still lying there in a storage pool at Tarapur. The separation plan declares certain institutions as civilian facilities, and the list of civilian facilities does not include BARC, IGCAR, or and Radha Ramana Center for Advanced Technologies. It also provides for measures which India can take against disruption of fuel supplies and India's right to take corrective measures which have been left undefined. So USA took some reciprocal actions. Uh, India did not satisfy some of the provisions of the US Atomic Energy Act with regard to cooperation with other countries. It was therefore necessary for the USA to enact a legislation to provide a waiver uh, from those provisions to enable signing of a nuclear cooperation agreement with India. Uh, India is a country outside NPT and having an active nuclear weapon program. U.S. Atomic Energy Act uh, says that U.S. cannot cooperate uh, with a country having active nuclear weapon program and not subjecting all its activities to comprehensive safeguards of the IAEA. So they had to give India pass a legislation to provide a waiver to India for this purpose, and they started working on a legislation uh, which was called Henry J. Hyde Act. It was passed by them in December 2006. So on the one hand, merits of Hyde Act and all aspects of nuclear cooperation were debated both in the USA and India. The negotiations uh, for finalizing the text of the nuclear cooperation agreement, they continued as per the joint statement. <coughs> After the conclusion of uh, negotiations to facilitate NCA with India, USA passed another act in October 2008, uh, which was US-India Nuclear Cooperation and Non-Proliferation Enhancement uh, uh, Act, which enabled it to, uh, to sign a nuclear cooperation agreement with India. So while all this was going on, simultaneously, uh, India's specific safeguards agreement was uh, being negotiated with the Secretariat of the IAEA, and this has uh, several uh, drafting challenges. Now, uh, IAEA has three different uh, types of safeguards agreements. One is comprehensive, which is mandatory for all the non-nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states who have signed NPT to go in for a comprehensive safeguards agreement. It brings all the facilities, all the full territory of the country under safeguards of the IAEA. Second is facility specific, which limits safeguards to certain identified uh, facilities. And third is voluntary offer safeguards agreement, which are, uh, that facility of voluntary offer safeguards agreement is available only to nuclear weapon states that they can choose some facilities and offer them for safeguards. Uh, we didn't want to go in for a safeguards agreement uh, as and when India offers a facility of safeguard. This would have meant that we'd have several texts of safeguards agreement. Today we offered five reactors, the safeguard agreement. After 10 years, we built more reactors. We offer them for safeguards. So uh, we do not know how situations will change over the years and what kind of additional responsibility, additional constraints will be imposed on India. When totally, totally uh, just the word of diplomacy and politics, it goes, it keeps changing depending upon how strong a nation is. So we wanted a mother agreement which is applicable today and which remains applicable subsequently. This item, uh, facility-specific safeguards agreement, they are meant for individual facilities. 
And when we started negotiations, we already had uh, certain facility-specific agreements. For Tarapur 1 and 2, we had an agreement. We had an agreement for heavy water, which was uh, uh, for uh, certain fuels, which was supplied to us. We had a safeguards agreement with uh, DAPS 1 and 2. So we evolved a, what I should say, a mother agreement, where all facilities will be in the annex. We took guidance from the format meant for the facility-specific agreement. Uh, this total idea was to ensure that no new conditions are imposed in uh, subsequent years. And we tried to build certain concepts, which were built in the separation plan. These concepts were that uh, uh, this particular safeguard agreement is meant for facilitating full nuclear cooperation, access to international fuel market, building strategic reserve of uh, nuclear fuel, corrective measures if the fuel supply is uh, interrupted. All these concepts were built into the preamble of the agreement. And then we use the phrase, taking into account of the, taking into account all above, we agree to the following. So idea was to tightly couple the preamble to the operating part of the safeguards agreement. Then again, at that time, since things were evolving, this uh, negotiation were going on in 2007-2008 time frame, we place our facilities in the safeguard as per separation plan, and then US Congress didn't pass that, then we would have been in a limbo. So what we did, we sort of took care of this part. We said we had an annex to the agreement which had no entry to start with. And we populated that annex only after all steps were taken, and those steps were built into the uh, safeguard agreement itself. So facility, this aspect was criticized by uh, many people, those who earned their living by writing article on non-pro issues. They criticized it, but we said, it is necessary to build reciprocal steps. You do this, we'll do that. So there's a matching, and we are not taken for a ride at any stage. So what this agreement achieves, India's specific safeguard agreement, it has a preamble, which is coupled within itself and is tightly coupled to the operating operative part, making it necessary to look at the agreement as a whole. Preamble reflects India USA understandings, including fuel supply assurances, strategic reserve of nuclear fuel, and corrective measures. It provides for cooperation with all member states of the agency. It makes a subtle reference to non civilian program. This was very important for India at that time. Yes, we have a non civilian program, it is embedded there right in the uh, preamble. It ensures that institutes not handling nuclear materials remain outside safeguards. It, all, it is also ensured that heavy water plants remain outside safeguards. Scope of safeguard is limited to what is offered by India on the basis of its own determination. The agency cannot hinder or otherwise interfere in activities not covered by safeguard. This is explicitly written in the safeguards agreement. And purpose of safeguards is to guard against withdrawal of safeguarded material from civilian use. Here again, I just want to spend a few words that English language becomes important. One can say that diverting material to military facilities or strategic facilities, or one can say withdrawal of safeguarded material from civilian use. If you use the word withdrawal from civilian use, the focus of infection is a civilian facility. If we say diversion to military facility, the focus becomes military, which we didn't want IAA to come near to. So uh, when, uh, again, uh, here uh, I will say that uh, science, technology, social science, language, law, everything gets merged together if one is going forward in this kind of uh, issues. Application of safeguards is to facilitate cooperation. Safeguards on a facility to come into force after the following steps have been taken. Approval of the safeguards agreement by the Board of Governors of the IAEA. 
signatures on the agreement, notification by India about entry into force of this particular agreement, filing a declaration by India about its civilian facilities after all conditions conducive to the accomplishment of the objective of the agreement have been met. This protected us so that it, in case reciprocal action do not happen, we are taken care of. Notification by India offering civilian facilities for safeguards in a phased manner. We will not offer everything at once. It will go only when we are satisfied with everything. And only India has to determine when these steps are taken. Again, the full text of this particular safeguards agreement is an open domain. You can download it from the website. Now, there's a full clarity in this agreement to ensuring that certain facilities will be safeguarded only on a campaign mode. Okay, we want to carry out a civilian operation in a facility which otherwise is not offered for safeguard. This will be offered as safeguard only for that particular campaign. The following three categories of facilities will come under safeguard under this agreement after appropriate notification by India. That was all existing safeguarded facilities like Tarapur 1 and 2, Rajasthan 1 and 2, and facilities identified by India in the separation plan as civilian, and any facility identified by India as civilian in future, thereby it becomes a mother agreement. And uh, reference is made to corrective measures in the preamble. Paragraph four of this agreement refers to facilitating implementation of bilateral or multilateral arrangements essential for accomplishment of the objectives of the agreement, and paragraph 10 refers to international law. Paragraph 29 refers to a particular decision of the Board of Governors, uh, which is again very important. I think uh, I see the watch moving ahead, so I will not go into that detail. And paragraph 52C provides for reporting. Uh, once all this uh, happened, uh, NSG guidelines to facilitate civil uh, nuclear cooperation were uh, relaxed by NSG. India had taken steps uh, for this purpose, a dialogue with several countries to open civil nuclear trade, and this dialogue at that time as a first step was with USA, France, and Russia. All three dialogues were going on simultaneously. Uh, we, all these, with the, these three countries, we negotiated the nuclear cooperation agreement, separation plan was notified to IAEA, which they have issued as a information circular, which they call as INSERC. ISSA was uh, finalized, and most important, they wanted certain uh, statement, and this statement was issued by External Affairs Minister Pranam Mukherjee at that time on 5th September 2008 which reiterated India's stand on disarmament and non-proliferation. This was our conventional stand, which we have been always saying time and again. This was put in a concise one and a half page document and was released on 5th September. And as a result of all these steps, guidelines for civil nuclear trade with India were relaxed by Nuclear Suppliers Group on 6th September 2008. And this, of course, had been issued by IAEA as uh, information circular. Uh, so WMD, WMD Act 2005, SCOMET list issued by India, and licensing guidelines issued by Department of Atomic Energy 2007, all this were taken to mean that yes, we have harmonized our export control rules with that of nuclear suppliers group. Several uh, nuclear cooperation agreements have been signed subsequently. Uranium has been imported and uh, agreements to construct four more reactors at Kudankulam have been signed. Again, people uh, say that uh, after this NSG clearance, no more reactors construction are moving forward. It was not possible to sign agreement to construct these four reactors at Kudankulam, additional four reactors beyond the first two, unless there was a waiver from NSG. So during this entire process, uh, the, there was opposition from some countries, and real opposition, opposition came from what has been described by Shiv Shankar Menon in his book as the 
Mini 6, Ireland, Austria, Switzerland, New Zealand, Norway, and the Netherlands. These com uh, all these countries are very strong about NPTs and uh, non-proliferation regime, but uh, they opposed it, but finally uh, our diplomats worked day and night, visited all the capitals prior to this meeting, and they, were, they withdrew their uh, opposition to this agreement. Okay, so in the, just a few words on the nuclear cooperation agreement with the USA, there are certain very important features built into this agreement. Again, this agreement is in the public domain. You can download it from the DA website. First, the core issue that integrity and reliability of strategic program, pursuit of closed fuel cycle, which we articulate as three-stage program and R&D should be preserved. Article 2.4 has uh, three uh, elements. Uh, it protects independent development and specifically refers to non-hindrance in programs which have not been offered for IEA safeguards. Uh, USA is very much concerned by uh, information exchange. Some scientist comes to you, tells you something, and that becomes my information. If you use that information, they will say our information has been used. So we wanted to ensure that uh, there, there are no any frivolous uh, uh, issues arise subsequently. So information has been precisely defined. Before, they have to talk, tell before, convey that information in writing. Just oral exchange uh, in the corridor is not information. So there's a precise definition built in of information uh, is this, uh, in Article 1H. Article 12 says the agreement is to be implemented in a manner which avoids hampering or delaying or interferes in other activities. The provisions of this agreement are not to be used to interfere with nuclear policy or programs. So all this is a layered approach. This is built into several articles so that integrity and reliability of our strategic program is preserved. IEA safeguards agreement and fuel supply assurances are built into the whole thing. There's an article 5.6 which reproduces verbatim para 15 of the separation plan which supplies for fuel supply assurances, safeguards, and corrective measures. Article 10.2 uh, is on IEA safeguards and the linkage between safeguards and fuel supply assurances. Then on termination, termination and cessation of cooperation, Article 8 states, it is not the purpose of the provision of this article regarding cessation of cooperation, a right of return, to derogate from the rights of the parties under Article 5.6, and 5.6 is fuel supply assurances, safeguards, and corrective measures. There's a linkage such that the, if they, nobody can tell us that we are stopping cooperation basically with the purpose to derogate fuel supply assurances and corrective measures. Then, of course, Article 14.5 refers to uninterrupted operation of nuclear reactors. We prov have provided for IAEA safeguards in the right from the title, title is IAEA safeguards, so bilateral safeguards are not uh, uh, mentioned uh, anywhere. Uh, Article 10.2 refers to India's specific safeguards agreement. Article 10.4 states that if IAEA decides the application of IAEA safeguards is no longer possible, the supplier and recipient should consult and agree on appropriate verification measures. Article 14.3 says that finding of safeguards compliance has to be made only by the Board of Governor of IAEA. It cannot be done by USA just on its own. It has to be a decision, a considered decision of the Board of Governors of IAEA where India is always a member. Then of course uh, the, the definition of byproduct material, several byproducts, radioactive materials are generated during uh, uh, spent fuel reprocessing and it has been so defined that they, in the name of inspection of bilateral material, by, uh, in, in the byproduct material, bilateral safeguards are not triggered. Uh, scope covers the nuclear reactors and aspects of uh, associated nuclear fuel cycle, provides for 
uh, sensitive nuclear technologies only after amendment. The most important, it grants consent for reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel. Not only grants consent, it provides a time limit to agreeing to an arrangements and procedures for implementing this particular uh, reprocessing provision. So I, I think this is very important. Uh, when we were negotiating at that time, while USA has a nuclear cooperation agreement with several countries, they provided uh, programmatic uh, on a program basis consent for reprocessing only to Japan and no other country. Many other countries have been talking to them and uh, they were not agreeing. In, we said that we cannot proceed further since a pursuit of a closed fuel cycle is a part of our policy. This has to be built into the agreement. So we uh, write it, this consent is built, it, uh, built into this and further details to be worked out within one year that is also built into nuclear cooperation agreement and this has, was done within one year and this particular agreement was signed. And of course, it permits transfer of dual use items for ENR facilities, that is enrichment and uh, reprocessing facilities as per applicable laws, regulations, and policies. Then uh, there's a extensive uh, article on uh, cessation of cooperation. I think I'll, uh, 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 once this NCA was agreed, ISSA was agreed, there was additional protocol which was to be agreed with the IAEA. Now, this, how this uh, additional protocol came into being, uh, there was a fear in the mind of U USA that uh, there are certain uh, uh, facilities in countries like Iraq, which they have not declared to IAEA. And, and they cannot just go, IAEA cannot go and detect, uh, inspect those facilities since they have not been declared. So additional protocol is meant to help detect undeclared nuclear facilities. There's a standard template for non-nuclear weapon states, and nuclear weapon state can choose measures identified by them, which they think uh, will contribute to non-proliferation and efficiency aims of the protocol. So, but at that time, when this was being negotiated, uh, the board authorized the director general to negotiate protocols with other states. Other states mean those who have not signed uh, NPT, that are prepared to accept measures provided by them in the model protocol in pursuance of safeguards, effectiveness, and efficiency. What it means is essentially that those states which are not signatory to NPT, they can pick and choose clauses. This provision was built in. The person who was responsible for building this provision was our own science counselor who was posted in Vienna at that time. So, uh, the thinking that we have to follow closed fuel cycle, we have to protect our facility, this has been embedded uh, in both uh, on the scientific staff and diplomats from India for a very, very long time. So Indian additional protocol limits the provision of additional information to just nuclear exports that will inform uh, we are, when we export any nuclear items to a third country, We'll inform IAEA just that we have exported this item to country X, uh, uh, this item to country Y, and grants no physical access to the IAEA. To in general physical access, that they can come and do environmental monitoring to locate where our uh, nuclear facilities are. Additional protocol also adds to a commitment to IAEA that we'll give them, they wanted free communication facilities so that rather than uh, uh, posting all the reports, they can upload the reports with the help of uh, emails. Uh, this, is, this was something which uh, a transmission and information which is generated by the agency. Because they have cameras at all the locations. Whenever any material is moved, they come to know. They want it linked to Vienna, and this is what we have done. No permission is included in this additional protocol which grants them access to places other than those which we have identified as civilian. So that is why the word an additional protocol was built into the joint statement in the beginning. Uh, there were additional issues which I've already said that arrangements and uh, procedures for reprocessing. 
There is a separate agreement with the USA. Now, it includes features as, as IAEA would use for implementation of safeguards. Only those features have been included in this particular uh, agreement. And uh, plutonium, which wherever plutonium is generated, the physical uh, security of the facilities becomes very important. And that for that physical security, IAE has certain guidelines which are included in IMSA 225. At that time, it was Revision 4. Now it is Revision 5. This is something which uh, uh, we are very happy about it because the people who have negotiated uh, this particular information circular, they are, we had our representatives always present there. So we know, uh, we also want to protect our facilities. We know that our country has uh, all the uh, issues with the terrorists coming from all sides. So this particular provision only has been built into there. And there is a pro international convention for physical protection of nuclear materials which was negotiated in 1980, and in 2005 it was amended. Again, India was a, has been a party to this convention. It's again a useful convention for providing physical protection. So this was also uh, this included. So though we have a specific agreement for arrangements and procedures for reprocessing, it kind of adds on what we have been already doing or what we have already agreed to. Then there were administrative arrangements uh, which had to be negotiated with the USA in detail as to how we'll implement various provisions of nuclear cooperation agreement. This is again a very detailed document uh, where uh, so much has to be built in. Again, every time we had to ensure that yes, whatever we don't want to tell others, that we will not tell. So this requires precise knowledge of their laws, our laws, interna international treaties, and international uh, guidelines. And then uh, US uh, was given, yes, we will buy 10,000 uh, 10, megawatt worth of reactors from them, but there is very strict conditions included uh, in that letter which was issued to them. I'll come to it if time permits. So what are the out outcomes of this initiative? Has it influenced positively or negatively the strategic program of India? Answer is no. However, that program is independent. It was going on and will continue to go on the way it was going on further. This particular uh, opening up of civil nuclear cooperation did not influence our strategic program. Has the initiative influenced our nuclear power program? Uh, here, uh, many people are skeptical, though it has not uh, influenced in any way. No, the fact is that we have imported uranium. The capacity factors of our reactor have increased. Kudan uh, I think, let me. This indicates in 2009-10, capacity factors have gone to 61%. I think year before that, they were 50%. And you see steadily rising. And generation, in terms of a million units, continuously increasing. 1718, it came down to 70% because of some problem in Kudumkulam 1 reactor. As far as pressurized heavy water reactors are concerned, they are operating at higher and higher capacity factors because now uranium is fully available to them. Now, it's not that uh, we have, uh, we are importing, uh, we did all this to realizing that uranium in short supply, there were some problems in opening new mines. A parallel efforts were launched in early, something around 2002 to 2003 to augment domestic supplies. Domestic supplies also have improved uh, the last 10 years because of opening of new mines in Jharkhand and a new mine has been opened in Kadappa in uh, Andhra Pradesh. How has the initiative influenced India's global standing in R&D? Well, uh, there has been a significant expansion in scientific and technological exchanges. India has joined ITER, uh, Jules Horowitz reactor, which is a, a reactor coming up uh, in France, uh, south of France, the, the city of Mars in the area called Kadarash. Jules, it's a high flux reactor. India has been uh, provided, I think, 3% uh, cost of this reactor and will be able to carry the experiments there. There's a facility fair in uh, Germany. LIGO with USA, Square Kilometer Array, uh, uh, and India has become associate member of CERN. 
India has become an associate country of the International Energy Agency. So about ITER, I'll provide some more details. Has uh, there been a cost to separation? No. What's the cost? All we have to do is we have to earmark uh, some people, a couple of people who will keep reporting to IAEA with regard to safeguard measure. That's all. There has been no other cost. Will the initiative strengthen global proliferation regime, which was claimed by the uh, uh, non-pro lobby in the USA? Now, that depends on how you look at it. India has adhered scrupulously to every, I think it's spelling the wrong year, sorry. India has scrupulously adhered to every rural canon in this area. This was part of a statement with uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh made to the US Congress in his speech on 19th of uh, July, one day after the joint statement was signed. So there is no change. We have been scrupulously following every rule and canon in this area. And of course, uh, uh, the regime established by NPT is discriminatory. As I've said, uh, all it uh, means is early bird gets the nuke. And if we add one more discrimination, it is of no consequence. It's discriminatory, you're adding some more, it's okay. So what's wrong with it? So in my personal opinion, there is uh, uh, no influence on the global regime established by the NPT. But the non-pro lobby uh, looks at it in a different way. The deal tries to address proliferation risks by assessing the character of regime and governments. Okay. The Indian government is following a certain path, so you are rewarding Indian government. They are saying it's not a law-based regime, it's a distortion of laws. So it's an exception to rule-based regime that was ex existing prior to the deal. So their worry is now other countries like Pakistan or Israel or North Korea or Iran, they will also raise similar demands. But here I think every country has to be treated based on its own credentials. Uh, what are the other outcomes of this initiative? India was always a responsible state with the nuclear power and uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, programs. The international community uh, now has uh, formally acknowledged it. India participated in the nuclear security summit process only to start with 34 countries were invited to participate. Later on it became number 40. India has been participating right at the beginning and we participated in the nuclear security summit process at Washington in 2010, then Seoul in 2012. Uh, the Netherlands in 2014, again in Washington in 2016. And uh, as a, I was the sous chef of the government for all the four summits and I could directly interact with the various delegations, how they look at India because of the science and technology strength and strength of diplomacy. This was very much evident because each of the security summits were preceded by some five or six preparatory meetings which were held around in various uh, uh, countries. Uh, India is now a member of various uh, control regimes, export control regimes, like the Vasnar Arrangement, Australia Group, and MTCR. And of course, we have filed an application to be member of NSG, where all other countries have agreed, only China is holding out uh, once, uh, ho I hope uh, in, there will be a time in future when they will also agree to this. So let me spend a few minutes on ITER. Okay. Uh, I'll just quickly go through it that uh, this was a journey uh, which we started uh, negotiations uh, subsequent to joint statement. But basically, this invitation came to us because of the strength which was nurtured by us at Institute for Plasma Research, where our scientists and engineers have been working since 1988 on this. It was based on that scientific strength that we have been able to join ITER. This involved, again, several steps, uh, several uh, meetings. We presented our case to the 10th meeting of negotiators uh, in Cadarache in France. Then there was a meeting in Vienna, then informal exchange of views with uh, various parties. And Japan was the holdout. So our diplomats started working on this issue. So a senior politician of Japan visited uh, uh, India, 
this exchange of views continued, and finally, we were invited uh, to join uh, negotiators' senior support group, in which was meeting was held in Jeju in uh, South Korea, uh, from a full one week, which was followed by negotiators' meeting on 6th of December 2005, and India was admitted to the ITER project by all the countries agreed. And the immediately first demand was that you have to host a meeting of the ITER preparatory committee in India, which we did in Goa because this was their demand. And uh, here, uh, Indian delegation and delegation from all other countries are present. And the importance which was being attached by certain uh, other countries to ITER can be seen by the presence of uh, uh, Admir uh, Academician Velikov in this group. I think I'll quickly go through. Then uh, after this, uh, the agreement was initialed in Brussels, then signed, where Dr. Kakotkar signed on behalf of India. So all the heads of delegation along with the uh, President of France and President of EU. Then first interim ITER Council, all the heads of delegation, that's where I started uh, attending these meetings of the ITER Council. Then, of course, ITER is a fusion reactor which aims to produce 500 megawatt administered by ITER Council by a joint implementation agreement, India contributing 9%. So I just uh, go quickly go through the fact that uh, why this particular initiative is important. Electricity in India, its demand is continuously growing. And it will continue to grow for the years to come for the simple reason you can, electricity use per capita is on the x-axis, on the y-axis is human development index, which is a combined parameter determining a combination of three dimensions, health, education, and living standards. Unless we reach a per capita consumption of 5,000, after that only HDI start tapering off. That's the minimum which we have to aim at and per capita consumption of electricity in Singapore is 9,000, Malaysia 4,656, Thailand 2,621, and the world average is 3,052. We must aim to reach 5,000. Assume India's population will stabilize at 1.6 billion people. Transmission and distribution loss is 7%. What we need is 8,600 billion kilowatt hour in this country in the last fiscal we produced 1,500. So we have to travel this journey from 1,500 to 8,600. And the way we have been growing at 6% generation rate in the last uh, 10 years, if we continue to grow like that, we will reach there by the middle of uh, this century. So while we should exploit full potential of hydro, wind, and solar, but that potential is not enough for us to reach 8,000 600. So we should have a combination of hydro, solar, wind, and nuclear, because coal, we have to continue till that time, but coal has to be phased out for, because of issues related to carbon emissions. So nuclear generation is a must and should be ramped up as soon as possible. We have a properly established governance system in the country, technology options, Areas for medium and long term deployment are available, uh, and we should go ahead with these technologies. And in conclusion, I will say that India has a very high density of population. The solutions which are applicable to other countries are not applicable to India. We are now close to 400 persons per square kilometer of territory, as against 29 in USA, around 10 in Brazil, and uh, Argentina, around three in Canada, around 110 in European Union. So our solutions have to be unique to us. Those countries can afford to devote large tracts of land to growing energy crops, to putting solar cells. How can we do it? Full potential of hydro, wind, and solar must be exploited. However, their potential on the basis of technology, which we know today, is lower than the projected demand. 
the technologies for nuclear are known, we must, uh, and uranium is no longer a constraint, we can import uranium from the international market, so we should ramp up nuclear generation in this country so, that to, so as to meet the growing electricity demand. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Glover. I hope uh, there will be some questions uh, will be yes. linked to us. Yes. First of all, first of all, you should congratulate uh, nuclear people. The question is, first question, is it relevant, sir, compared to other countries, sir, our part of the consumption of the country, which is utilizing other countries, there may be much gold is there. The per consumption of India, is it necessary compared to the other countries? Second question, what I want to say is, is it other countries are going back to the some traditional things and solar is a much more cheap you are getting? Is it necessary to continue nuclear things? Thank you. So, uh, compliments on your negotiation capability. Probably you should leave HBI and be the permanent Indian uh, part of the permanent Indian negotiation team. Thank you, thank you. Uh, maybe I think the chair may have missed out your law. Degree in your uh, so my question is that is the availability of uniform and this deal in particular has it affected uh, uh, the thorium based uh, three stage process uh, the thing which the funds which have been made available and the pace at which it is going and when would it be available if at all for commercial application? Okay, fine. Any other? Sir, I have a similar I have a question on a similar line. Uh, in European Union, uh, I think in Europe, the, the amount of energy used from nuclear is around 60-70% if I am not wrong. What is the percentage in the current scenario India is using and what is the aim or target to supply the sufficient amount of energy that is required? Okay, let me first take up this question and then we can see. Uh, first of all, uh, a general comment on uh, uh, renewable energy. Electricity is a commodity which cannot be stored. You switch on the button, you want electricity to be available. Well, sun will shine during the daytime, not during the evening time. Wind blows at certain hours, it doesn't blow at all hours. So solar and wind are intermittent sources while nuclear and coal are dispatchable sources, they are available to you when you need them. So when we talk of cost of solar and wind coming down, uh, we have to consider something more than that. You have a plant which generates electricity, then we have transmission and distribution grid, and then comes the consumer. The, when we say that solar has re achieved parity, that is parity at the generator end, not at the consumer end. Between the generator and the consumer, there's a whole lot of things which are called transmission and distribution grid. Discoms or distribution companies have to ensure that when solar and wind is not available, some other plant comes online. There is no guarantee that solar and wind will be available when the consumer needs it. The peak demand in India is at 8 p.m. 8 p.m. there is no solar. So the dispatchable plants, that is nuclear and coal, their total capacity has to be designed to match the peak demand, because at the time of peak demand, solar is not there. So you are investing in coal and plant or nuclear plant, currently more in coal plant, there is less of nuclear in this country. But because you want to give priority feed into solar, capacity factors of coal fired power plants are coming down. The shortage in electricity in India happens in the month of September, October. At that time, the power exchange takes place based on bids which are received. And that amount of the cost of that power is very high. And this year, 
it reached that I think peak of 17 rupees if my memory is the correct 16 point something seven one. So because you would need electricity at a time and that is not available. So solar currently is piggyback taking a piggyback ride on co investment in coal which has been made. The result of this a uh, false impression in the minds of public that yes, solar is cheap, we should do that, we invest that. But we should invest that by investing good money in transmission and distribution network, in ensuring that when solar is not there, others are there. So the result is that we are having uh, non-performing assets, that the loans which have been given to the coal-fired plants, they have become non-performing assets. And as citizens, when the bank doesn't get the loan back, or as citizens, we only pay through taxes. So let us remember one thing, that there is a generator end parity, there's a consumer end parity. A grid, a plant doesn't live alone. A plant is connected to the grid and interacts with the consumer through that grid. So one has to look at the cost of generation and cost of maintaining the grid so that we have reliable, assured power supply to the consumer. So this is one thing which we should know. So now, if you invest in storage at the location where solar and wind is generated, the storage technologies at the moment are very expensive. Unless their costs come down, at the consumer end, renewables will be expensive. I think uh, there was a compliment from a gentleman here. Let me say that I was not alone. It was a group of people who negotiated, which included people from Prime Minister's office and representatives from MEA. I said we worked as a team, and this is what I say, we have to work in all the agencies of the government have to work in sync to achieve the results. There was strengths on the diplomatic side. Uh, uh, they had a certain way of looking at the language. I had a certain way of looking at the language. We pulled our uh, sort of uh, strengths together and moved on. Uh, European Union, yes, the France uh, has uh, around uh, 70, uh, I think 80 percent uh, of electricity comes from uh, nuclear. EU as a whole 25% electricity is coming from uh, nuclear. So it's very interesting thing is happening in the Western world. Those who uh, are against nuclear in India, they read only one part of the news, not the other part of the news, uh, as to they, they are abandoning nuclear power. But is the reality so? Let me start with the France. Uh, France is uh, developing a new concept of a fast breeder reactor so that in future they can go in for that. In uh, USA, uh, two years back they had set up a Blue Ribbon Commission. Blue Ribbon Commission is set up by USA to debate certain important issues. This Blue Ribbon Commission was set up to debate on fuel cycle technologies, a categorical statement that we, USA should continue research to pursue in pursuit of closed fuel cycle. There's a generation four uh, forum to develop new reactor concepts, which include six different concepts. Out of that, four and a half are uh, based on closed fuel cycle. So R&D is continuing in those countries based on this. There was some countries uh, said that nuclear should be phased out, uh, I think. But now they are reversing the decision. Taiwan has already reversed the decision through parliamentary mandate that the nuclear should continue. Uh, in many states in the USA, laws have been passed to give some uh, priority to nuclear feed-in so that those plants can stay in. There are statements after statements uh, which say that uh, uh, nuclear has to come back if we want to go for de decarbonization. Uh, MIT has a group working on various energy technologies. They look at nuclear, coal, and renewables. Their report came, I think it was in uh, September this year, uh, where uh, there are categorical statements that if we want to achieve 1.5 degree temperature rise to limit uh, uh, climate issues, uh, want we have to go for deep decarbonization, and for that 
nuclear is a must. There is a nuclear uh, community has to work on improving the economics further. We have to bring down the economics and that has been recognized and we are continuously uh, trying to work on that. Uh, in India, aim has to be to ensure that, uh, first of all, uh, uh, to say that uh, if other people are using more energy, we should not use it. This is something which is not acceptable to the community, to the youth in this country. Let us see uh, if anyone of you has been following air conditioning market. It is growing at a CAGR of 10% for the last 10 years. Cooling requirement, cold storage requirements are growing at the rate of 20% continuously. And this is, which is a must if we want to give remunerative prices to our farmers. The sale of inverters to, so that people get assured power supply is growing at the CAGR of 14.7%. Does it tell you that India doesn't need energy? India needs assured energy. Air conditioning, cooling requirements are growing at such an alarming pace that India is the only country where the government of India has issued a draft cooling action plan to solicit reasons for people as to how we should go forward with this. This plan was issued, I think, sometime in October for comments. No other country in the world has issued such a particular plan. There are people who are saying that we should go back to a frugal way of living. But the young generation doesn't tell me that they want to go in that direction. They want to have air-conditioned spaces. They want to use the uh, uh, communication devices. They want to watch TVs. And all these devices need energy to manufacture, energy to operate. To compare a kitchen of 1970 to, to a kitchen in 2018, in the kitchen, kitchen today, in every household, you'll have a refrigerator, you'll have a uh, air conditioner, you will have several mixer grinders, you will have a washing machine in the household. All these electrically operated gadgets, uh, then you will have uh, microwave ovens, so all these devices will be there. They need electricity to manufacture and electricity to operate. So while, yes, there are people who are saying that we should adopt a frugal way of life, they will do it themselves, but they cannot impose their wills on others on young people, they are moving in a totally different direction. And we should also have to realize here, if we suppose we impose a frugal way of life in our country, our security will be jeopardized. We cannot move away from the nation surrounding us. A country like Malaysia, which is another country, the tropical climate is about to reach 5,000, and we are at a low level of 1,100. We have to go to that level, and for that, we need more and more. Uh, nuclear. Coal, yes, we have plenty of coal, but how much the total economically viable coal in this country? The way our consumption of coal is growing, the coal is not going to last for more than five to six decades. So we have to invest in technologies to mine that coal which currently we are not able to mine. So we have to move in this direction. And uh, then there was a question on uh, thorium program. Uh, now here I think I'll have to go to physics a little. Those uh, uh, others maybe can excuse me for going into these details in science. We have formulated a program which says that initially we'll uh, have thermal reactors which are based on uh, uranium, heavy water, or now enriched uranium and light water. In the second stage, we go for fast reactors which are based on uranium-plutonium system. Why this has been formulated? That fast reactors which are based on uranium-plutonium system have a certain breeding ratio. That is, they produce more fuel than what they consume. Uh, and therefore, we can increase the installed capacity base based on nuclear. Moment which is to thorium, thorium is, the breeding ratio comes down. Supposing based on our second stage program, we are able to reach a capacity of, uh, say, 200 gigawatt in this country. With the help of thorium, we'll be able to sustain that 200 gigawatt. We cannot increase it beyond 200 gigawatt because the breeding ratio is just marginally above one. So because of that, 
while we have to continue R&D on thorium, but actual setting up of thorium system has to be delayed till we know, okay, now we, we have reached the level which is sufficient for us to sustain on a long-term basis. So these are the reasons why thorium deployment has to be delayed while R&D has to be continued. This, uh, so th this, I think, uh, answers your question. Okay? For deep decarbonization, nuclear energy is the solution. Uh, that's what I explained. Solar at the, uh, we should try that. We should exploit the full potential of solar and renewables. But do we have sufficient amount of that potential in the country? What is the total potential of wind energy in the country? What the total potential of solar in this country? Exploit that. Use that. But that will give you only something like 2,000 uh, 2, terawatt hour. Our total needs, if we aim at 5,000, 8,600 terawatt hours. Where from the balance come? Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Uh, well, yes, we, well, they are citizens of India, they have certain perception, we have to talk to them. We continue to talk to all the people who ask uh, qu these questions and we answer them. But these questions are emerging in a very, very, what should uh, say, the perception is being modified by misinformation at times. I'll give you example. In many parts of the country, because of excessive water which we take from the ground, this water, uh, what we call it, water table is going down. As the water table goes down, certain elements which are there at a lower level depth, they are getting into water and coming out. This is happening in many places because uh, uh, say around Jaduguda mine area, the water table has gone down. Because of that water table going down, Uranium, which is there deep in the earth, is coming up. People have, uh, propaganda has started that it is because of Jadugata mine. This, it has nothing to do with Jadugata mine. Similarly, in certain areas in north, particularly Punjab, Haryana, in several parts, there's a lot of uranium in water. That uranium is creating problems there because it, people are taking that water. Again, lo uh, sort of wrong perceptions are created. Here, by a sort of appeal to everybody is look at the scientific facts, analyze them, and then take your, make, form your opinion about what is happening. And certain people, uh, I was involved, talking to some politician in uh, case of uh, Jaitapur reactor. Uh, simple thing they were saying was that uh, you are investing so much of money, hame bhi kuch de do. So we have to ensure that we move based on scientific facts. It is a very difficult task because this, so we have to, these people from my department, people from who are educated in science and technology, people who know these issues in social sciences have to continue to talk to people. We have to, yes, they are citizens of this country. We have to talk, explain, bring them around and move forward. Thank you, Dr. Grover. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Grover, for this lecture. May I now request Dr. Shailesh Naik to present a certificate to Dr. Grover for delivering this lecture. <laughs> So it's my present duty to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, first to Dr. Grover for his scholarly presentation and also taking us through what went into the realizing the, the civil cooperation agreement and the way forward and also the interaction and the questions which have been asked. And Dr. Shailesh Naik for sharing the session and conducting 
the, the, the lecture series. And to all of you who are here, and especially to the family of uh, Raja Ramanna who are here for being present and making it that special uh, for this lecture. And uh, Professor Srikant and Subha for, for conducting this thing and all the audience for being here and making it special. And of course, all the, the, the supporting um, colleagues from NIAS for conducting this lecture. And thank you, all of you, once again. Thank you.